Oh, good, good, good. Sunday morning, everybody. We're going to stand. We're going to worship Jesus Christ. Eyes wide, I'm set on you. You made a road in the wild. Standing on ancient truth. I'm pressing on with my back to the past and oh let the young see visions of the future and i say no let the old dream dreams again in my world god do a new thing i know you're with you bursting like heaven in motion but well, jesus you make me new i'm pressing on with my back to the past and oh let the young see visions of the future but not sing oh let the old dream dreams again in my Itself is a new day. Come on now. In my world, I do a new thing. I know you're moving. In my world. Let's make some noise for the God who created all this. The only reason this house is even here.
We could do better than that. Let's go. Oh, what a great, what a great morning. Thank you all for being here. I'm going to take a moment here. I'm going to pray. Please be in prayer with me. Pray for the people around you, for yourself and the circumstances in your life. Hear the words that come out of me and the words that are coming out of your heart. The Spirit pleads for us even when we don't know what to pray for. So we're just going to pray now and trust the Spirit to lead us in that, and I just encourage you to do the same with your own hearts. Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you so much for this beautiful Sunday morning. Thank you so much for your house here that you've built, the body of people here that you've assembled and that you're assembling now. And we just thank you so much that we can be a part of all that. We can be here to witness your agency in this, on this earth. It's marvelous, it's amazing. We look around and we see all this and we can come to no other conclusion other than none of this is possible if it, if it weren't for you. If you're not in the equation, if you're not in the conversation, if you're not in our hearts whispering to us, this building, this place, these words, these songs, none of it would be here. So thank you so much for that, God. We just pray that you'd help us to bear witness to that every day in our lives, whether we're in a dark place or a high place. Know that you're working in good ways always. We thank you so much for that. We thank you so much that you lead us through the fire. And even though it's hot, we don't get burned. It's not too much because you're with us. You stand in the fire with us, Jesus. Help us to believe that when we're doubtful. We just lift up our faith to you and ask you to help us build it up. It's in your name that we pray, Jesus. Amen.
When I look at the space between where I used to be in this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fight standing next to me. There was another in the waters holding back the seas. Should I ever need reminders? I've been set free There's a cross that bears the burden There another died for me There is another in the fire Yes, there is another in the fire All oh, my dad left for dead Water. I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore. And should I fall in the space between what remains of me in this reckoning? I know. I know that's where you 
yeah, count the joy, come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I count the joy, come every battle I know that's where you'll be Yes, I count the joy, come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be Can we give the Lord praise this morning? The hosts are going to come in just a moment and hand out our communion elements. And we believe three things about communion here at Cross Point Church. And one is this, is we believe that it should be the one thing that unites believers together. So we don't require that you be a member of our church or any church in order to partake of communion. The second thing that we believe it does is it should cause us to never forget the sacrifice that Christ has paid for us. And then finally, it should cause us to look inwards and to repent of our sins. And so here's what I'm going to encourage you to do as the worship team leads us in this next song. I would encourage you to just look inwards and say, God, is there anything in me that's not pleasing to you? And as the Holy Spirit reveals those things to you, that you would confess your sins to him this morning. So host, would you come and deliver, distribute the elements and let's continue to worship this morning. After the next song. Then I'll come back up here and we'll partake of the elements together. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me.
chapter 11, verse number 23, it says, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your love for us, for your grace, and for your mercy. And this morning, our hearts are in tune to what your spirit's doing. Lord, we thank you for your word that directs us to take this moment and reflect on the sacrifice that your son paid for us. And so this morning, we do that. We don't take your sacrifice lightly. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake of the bread together. same way also he took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes let's pray Jesus we thank you for your blood that was shed on the cross for us we thank you for your love for us that your sacrifice would purchase our eternity in heaven and so this morning we extend our gratitude to you for what you've done we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's partake of the juice together. Thank you, Lord. Each week we pray for a specific region or a specific nation. And this morning we're pray, praying for the Palestinian territories. There are over 4.4 million people who live there. 87.7% are Muslim, 0.1% evangelical Christians. There are four million Palestinian Arabs that have never one time heard the name of Jesus. And so let's pray for Jesus to be revealed uh, to the people and for a revival to sweep that nation. Let's pray this morning. God, we thank you for the Palestinian territories. Lord, we pray for the 4.4 million people that live there that you would let those who are followers of you let their light shine right. God, we pray that you would raise up people that would go and share your gospel with the four million people that have never one time heard your name. Jesus, we pray that you would reveal yourself to people and that as people interact and as they share the gospel, that there would already be a seed that had been sown in their hearts because of what you've done in their lives and how you've prepared them. Lord, as you look out across this room this morning, there are a number of different needs that are represented. Lord, you know each and every single person. You know the life circumstances that they're facing. And so, God, I pray that in this moment that, that you would perform miracles. As we've been preaching for the last five weeks about the miracles of Jesus, God, we pray that it wouldn't just be something that we read in the New Testament of your word, but it would be something that we would see live and demonstrated in our midst. And so, God, I pray for those that have come this morning needing a desperate touch from you. Lord, I pray that they would receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, make sure to shake the hands of those around you before you're seated.
Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. My name is Romeo Jamesi, and I get the privilege to talk about money. What is the will of God when it comes to money and giving? I've been reading a book uh, titled God and Money. And in this book, the author talks about a passage that I want to share with you. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 4 and 5 and 7 says this, However, there should be no poor among you in the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess as your inheritance. He will richly bless you if only you fully obey the Lord your God and are careful to follow this command I am giving you today. If there is a poor man among you, your brother, in any of the town of the Lord, give generously. Give with an open hand. I love how the scripture is clear in certain things. God makes it clear. What is his will when it comes to money and giving? When we give generously, God promised this to take care of us as well. The scripture says so. So I don't know where you are in terms of giving. I know at times, there's time in my life where it is difficult for me to give. But when I read the scripture, I'm encouraged to know this, that as I'm giving, God is going to be faithful to meet my need when I need. Amen? Amen? Let's have a generous heart because it does one thing for sure to us. It blesses our soul. It encourages us. It motivates us to do more for the kingdom of God. We work harder because we want to give more. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. God, thank you for your message this morning, Father. We know your will is to take care of the needies, to take care of the poor. Father, I pray and I thank you for the person that this message was for. I pray that that person, if they're having difficulty giving, may they go deeper in their walk with you and show them why you would like him to do it. I pray and ask this in Jesus' name. And the people of God says, amen. Well, good morning. I've got your announcements. It's good to see you guys this morning. Um, if this is your first time here, we just want to say welcome. We're so glad that you're here. If you would take the Connect card from the seat in front of you and fill it out and bring it to the Welcome Center, which is just outside these doors, I will be there after service. I'd love to meet you, get to know you, and give you a gift. So make sure you stop by and see me. Also, students, there will be no youth this Wednesday night because a whole pack of, of youth are going to camp this week, so make sure that you are in prayer for Pastor Levinsky and Mackenzie as they, <laughs> they spend the week with our students and also for our students, of course, that they encounter God in a powerful way. Um, also, if you would like to know how you can get involved in our church or become a member or are just curious, want to know a little bit more about us, the growth track is the thing that you want to check out. And that is coming up on August 10th. It's a Saturday from 9 to 1130. You can do all three growth tracks in one day, which is a great, great deal. So make sure you check that out and look at your bulletin. There's a few other announcements to check out. Great. A few weeks ago, we started a sermon series called The Miracles of Jesus. And through this series, we've seen that the miracles of Jesus demonstrate his absolute authority over uh, the devil, over sickness, over death and nature, thereby confirming to all that he is indeed the Messiah and the Son of God. Also, the signs and wonders of Jesus testify to his limitless compassion for people and his longing to see people set free from all bondage. I hope that over the last five weeks that this series has served to strengthen your faith as you've seen Jesus display his power over nature, over demons, over a paralyzed man, over blindness, and the healing of a woman who had suffered with an issue of blood for over 12 years, which is what we talked about last week. And here's what I want to say to you boldly and confidently this morning is this, that no matter your circumstance, Jesus has power over it. No matter what your circumstance, Jesus has power over it. Over it. Let that get into your spirits this morning. 
In, this pa- in the passage for this week, we're going to see Jesus display his divine power over death by raising a 12-year-old girl from the dead. We're going to pick up reading where we started last week, and then we're going to skip over the story of the woman who was healed with the issue of blood because we covered that last week. I would encourage you, if you've missed any of these messages, to listen online at crosspointwaverly.com. Let's turn to Mark chapter 5 this morning. Mark chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the seat basket in front of you. It's our gift to you. Here at our church, we believe that the Bible is very important. And so we've made a challenge and we're encouraging each person to be reading and engaging the Bible outside of a Sunday morning experience. And here's what I believe with all of my heart is that if you'll read it, if you'll obey it, if you'll memorize it, it'll change and transform your life. Let's begin reading with Mark chapter 5 this morning, verse number 21. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. Let's skip down to verse number 35. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Let's pray this morning. God, we thank you so much for your word and for the power that it has to transform our lives. We ask that over the next few moments that we would sense a demonstration of your spirit's power. Would you open up our ears to hear and our hearts to receive what you would have for us? In Jesus' name, amen. In the moments leading up to this passage, Jesus had just calmed a storm. And in that storm, the waves were crashing into the boats, and the disciples woke Jesus up and said, don't you care about us? We're about to die out here. And Jesus spoke to the wind and to the waves, and the storm was gone. After that, after the storm, he sets a man free from a legion of demons. No wonder there's been a crowd that's formed around Jesus. They've seen and they've heard about his power and what he can do, and they're pressing in around him. One version of the Bible says that they were crushing him. A great picture of this would be the lines at Black, on Black Friday outside of a Best Buy as someone's waiting to get that new flat screen television, you know, crowding around and crushing. Today we're going to see that Jesus is the giver of life. And even when we perceive that all is lost and hopeless, God still resurrects. We see that Jesus is the giver of life. And even when we perceive that all is lost and hopeless, God still resurrects. This passage starts with the story of Jairus who persuaded Jesus to come to his home to heal his 12-year-old daughter that was dying. We don't know what happened to the little girl. We don't know if there was an illness that she was facing. We don't know if she was in a horrible accident. All we know is that tragedy has struck their house. It struck this man, his wife, and their little girl. And this story reminds us that tragic events come unexpectedly. They're unannounced, and they're always unwelcome. And Jairus' daughter was not just sick. She wasn't just injured, she was dying. In fact, her next breath could be her last. And out of urgency and desperation, Jairus had left her and left the family to go be with Jesus and find him because Jesus was the only hope that she had. Let's look at verse number 22 again. It says, Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. As a loving father, Jairus came and fell at the feet of Jesus, and he pleaded earnestly with Jesus. The Greek verb for earnestly means to ask for earnestly, to beg or to plead, and that's what this father has done in the presence of Jesus on behalf of his daughter. 
Jairus' repeated requests of Jesus are broken down like this. Number one, he asks Jesus to come. Jairus is requesting Jesus to intervene and to act. The second part of the request is to touch his daughter, to put his hands on her. Jairus knows that, the only, that only the touch of God and love and mercy can save his girl from death. And finally, he asks Jesus to heal her, not to just come, not just to touch, but to bring healing. And Jairus' request is simple and to the point. The desperate cry of Jairus' heart is for the life of his daughter. And Jesus responds and goes with Jairus to his home. However, in the midst of them traveling to Jairus' home, they're interrupted by a woman that we discussed last week. She had an issue of blood for 12 years, and she made her way through the crowd and touched the hem of Jesus' garment, and there was this interruption on the way to his house. We don't know what Jairus thought when this interruption occurred and brought their urgent trip to heal his daughter to a grinding halt. But I imagine for us it would be the equivalent as if one of our kids was on a, on a life flight helicopter down to Iowa City knowing that every moment counted. And then all of a sudden someone radioed in that they needed all of the medical personnel on the helicopter to land this helicopter in the middle of nowhere to save someone else or to heal someone else. And while this urgency in our heart is for our child and while we would be pleased to know that that staff could help someone else and bring healing to someone else, if we know that our child maybe only has moments to live, there's going to be a conflict in our hearts. And so while we rejoice that they're able to do something here, there's the, scare, the, the fear that there might not be enough time for them and for us. Now I imagine for Jairus it was the same scenario. And for most of us, we don't like delays. It's hard for us to relax while waiting on God to accomplish his promises and his purposes. Maybe it's just me, but I think it's hard for us to relax while waiting on God to accomplish his promises and his purposes. Jairus stands watching Jesus' investigation of who touched the hem of his garment. Jesus had felt power escape from him in this moment. And Jesus looks around to see who's touched him. And the disciples mockingly say, Jesus, of course someone touched you. You're in a crowd of people that's crushing you. It would be easier to answer the question, who didn't touch you? For Jairus, probably that same thought, who cares who touched you? Whatever happened has happened. Let's get on with it and let's get to my house and let you heal my daughter. But perhaps as Jairus observed this woman healed from a blood disease, hope filled his heart for his daughter as well. Jairus already had the belief that Jesus could heal his daughter, otherwise he wouldn't have done what he did. I can only imagine that this moment only helped serve to build his faith. To where he thought, if he can do this for this woman, then surely he can heal my daughter. And so in this moment, Jesus has brought healing and there's rejoicing that this woman has been made well. And then in the next verse, Jairus, is, uh, Jairus would get the worst news that any parent could ever hear. In verse number 35, it says, while he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? The pain of loss fills Jairus' heart. At the same moment, a woman experiences healing of over 12 years of misery a man who's enjoyed the beautiful life of his daughter for 12 years experiences the greatest loss and pain. The delay seems to be fatal. Now I wonder what Jairus is thinking and those traveling with him at this time. I wonder if in their minds they thought, well, it's too late and why is Jesus still with us? Well, I guess you can get back to healing other people, Jesus, because my daughter's dead now. Thanks for making that woman a priority. How many know that sometimes we can say things out of hurt and frustration that can sting? And sometimes we can wish that there were verses in the Bible that weren't there. You know, like the verse that says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Because sometimes we say things that we then after saying that say, I didn't mean that. And if we didn't have that verse in the Bible, then maybe we could get by with that. But since we have that verse in the Bible, that out of the abundance of our heart, the mouth speaks, it's a good reminder for us to make sure that we guard our hearts and guard our tongue. Jesus overhears the report given to Jairus about his daughter's death and tells the grieving father. In verse number 36, he says, don't be afraid, just believe. Don't be afraid, just believe. It's like Jesus looks at this man and he says, look, I know that you're scared and that you're hurting right now, but I just need you to trust me. I just need you to trust me. 
He's challenging Jairus to trust with the very same conviction that the bleeding woman had just shown. This is the This is the great challenge for us as we navigate the valleys of pain, of death, of sufferings and hardship. Not to give ourselves over to fear, but to believe and trust God while letting him comfort us. Psalm chapter 23, verse number four says that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Faith and confidence in God are the antidotes to fear, to worry and anxiety. Faith and confidence in God are the antidotes to fear, to worry, and anxiety. Those of you who know me well know that one of the reasons why I can call my brother at 4 o'clock in the morning is because when I wake up, then I'm awake. And so when, if I try to fall back asleep, then my brain is just racing and I get mad because I can't fall back asleep. And so I'm just in this pattern where I'll just get on up and get a shower and come into work and be productive rather than lay in bed. And the other night... Something completely uh, out of character for me at at 2.30 in the morning, I woke up and I was worried and I was anxious about something. And so out of character for myself, I, I just in that moment, I said, Lord, I trust you and I need some more sleep. And no sooner than I had said that, then I was back to sleep. And so I just want to encourage some of you this morning that are struggling with anxiety or that are worrying about something or you're afraid about something to give it to Jesus and trust him to handle it. Faith and confidence in God are the antidotes to fear, to worry, and anxiety. Jesus continues his trip to Jairus' home with a smaller entourage. In verse number 37, it says, and he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. As he enters the home, there's a multitude of people that are crying and they're wailing. Jesus then asks the crowd, why is everyone lamenting? And Jesus says to them that the child is only sleeping, it's not dead. And in response to Jesus' statement in verse number 40, the people laugh at him. How many of you have ever responded so confidently at something to only immediately have second thoughts? I'm the only one? Okay, a couple of you. You laughed at something and then someone gave you a look? And you realize, oops, I shouldn't have laughed at that. I'll give you a for instance. Yesterday afternoon, my twin brother was laying on the couch. And his eyes had closed. And his child sees that his eyes are closed and yells from across the room. I laughed and laughed and laughed. And so you know what happened? The atmosphere calmed down. The kids calmed back down again. My brother closed his eyes again. So you know what I did? I laughed so hard. I was crying. (laughs) This is a warning for all of you who do not have children yet. And for those of you who maybe have nieces and nephews, that what you sow, you will reap. And so what my brother sowed with our two kids, he is reaping with his four kids, and I am loving every minute of it. These people laughed at Jesus, and he hadn't shared a joke. I wonder if afterwards they were like, I wasn't laughing at at what you said, Jesus, I was laughing at the way that they were laughing at what you said. And when Jesus declared that the girl was only asleep, Jesus meant that, uh, that she wasn't in a coma. The friends and relatives that were around her knew that she was dead, and so Jesus was probably saying that in this case, death was like sleep. And from a mourner's point of view, the girl's death would turn out to be like a sleep from which she was awakened. Her condition was not final, and it wasn't irrevocable. There is another story of Jesus raising someone from the dead that's found in John chapter 11. In John chapter 11, one of Jesus' friends named Lazarus has passed away. And verse number 11 says, after saying these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe. 
but let us go to him. So Thomas called the twins, said to his fellow disciples, let us go that we may die with him. There's some conversations that take place that I would encourage you to read on your own in, uh, in your own time. But let's continue down to verse number 38. It says, then Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. But Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him, let him go. Jesus raised this man from the dead. As we come back to the previous story of this young girl, Jesus has everyone leave the house other than the girl's two parents and the three disciples who had accompanied them. Jesus then takes the girl by the hand and says, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Then the girl immediately stood up and began walking. I love how the, the verse, uh, the, I love the attention to detail that the Bible gives us sometimes. And it says that uh, when this girl was uh, healed, that she got up and walked. And it says, and she was 12 years old. And so that way we know that the people weren't astonished and amazed that a newborn baby got up and walked. But instead this girl was 12, she should be walking. And so we get to this point in the story where the suspense has ended. And this is the climax of the story. Everything's been building up for this. This lady has been healed, and now this little girl is raised back to life. In verse number 42, they were immediately overcome with amazement. The miracle of raising Jairus' daughter demonstrates that Jesus, as the Son of God, has power over death itself. In fact, after his resurrection, Jesus is pictured in Revelation chapter 1, verse number 18, where he says, I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. This doesn't mean that death no longer exerts its influence over humankind. Death is active within our lives and can devastate all of us. But as Paul points out, Jesus is reigning. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 25 and 26, it says, For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And Jesus has set in motion the hope and the assurance of all, of all our resurrections to come. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 20, Paul says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Death is still active, but it's not final, and it will be defeated. Jesus' resurrection over death provides every believer great hope. And for us today, this miracle shows God gives life even to that which is dead. And even when we perceive that all is lost or hopeless, God still resurrects. And so we've seen three different stories this morning of people that have been raised to life physically. Jairus' daughter and Lazarus and finally with Jesus. The greatest resurrection that ever happened was for Jesus to be raised from the dead. He was hung on a cross. He was beaten and left to die. He was buried in a tomb. And three days later, he miraculously came back to life. But Jesus came to deal with something much more important than physical death. Jesus came to deal with spiritual death. Jesus came to deal more with our spiritual condition than our physical condition. I'm going to ask the worship team to come. Let's look at Ephesians Chapter 2, verse number 1. Paul writes, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Here's what I believe this morning is that there are some of you that people have been pleading for your spiritual condition as intently as Jairus did for his daughter's physical condition. 
Jairus was desperate for a healing touch of God for his daughter. And he left his household and he bowed down at the feet of Jesus and asked him to come to his house. And here's what I believe is that all of you have come here today not by accident, but because God wanted you here. And maybe there are some of you who your parents have been pleading and crying out to God on your behalf that you would no longer be spiritually dead, but that you would be brought to life. I'm going to ask that you would bow your heads and close your eyes all across this room this morning. Maybe there are some of you who've come in and you say, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. I've never asked him to be my Lord and Savior. And you say, today I want to enter into a relationship with him. Maybe there are others of you that have turned your backs on God. You've turned away from him and you say, I, I need to see my relationship restored back to him. In just a moment, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's you, you say, I need to ask Jesus to come into my life for the very first time. Or you say, I need to see my relationship restored back to him. When I count to three, why don't you slip up your hands all across this room. One, two, three. Lift them up all across this room. One, two. You can put them down. Three, four. Are there others this morning? Let's stand all across this room. There were at least four hands that went up this morning of people who need to ask Jesus to come into their life for the very first time or who need to see their relationship restored back to him. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna lead us in a prayer and if you raise your hand, I want you to repeat it after me and mean it with everything that's within you. But know that you won't be praying this prayer alone but that each of us in support of you will also be praying. Let's pray. Say, dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for me. I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I've messed up. This morning I ask for your forgiveness. Come and give me a fresh start. Be my king, be my savior. Take over every area, take over every aspect and help me from this day forward to live for you with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my mind, with all of my strength. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give God praise for what he's done this morning. Thank you, Lord. If you raise your hand this morning, we want to encourage you along in your journey. We'd encourage you to text CPC Decided to 77948. CPC Decided to 77948. Or if you prefer, there's an I Decided card in the seat pocket in front of you. You can fill that out and drop it off with the host on your way out. We just want to encourage you in your journey. I want to pray for us, wrap up our service in prayer. Before I do, just want to mention again, Jason and Sharice will be standing right outside these doors. would encourage you to shake their hands, love on them this morning, and, uh, and just visit with them. So let's pray. God, we thank you that over the last six weeks, we have seen miraculous stories. We've seen stories where you've done the impossible. And Lord, we cry out on behalf of those in this room and those that... Uh, that are part of our family and friends and network of people that, Lord, that we would see you do exceedingly and abundantly more than we could ever dream, ask, or imagine in their lives. God, as we prayed earlier, that, that seeing signs and wonders and miracles wouldn't just be something that we read about in the New Testament, but it would be something that we experience even in this church. And so, God, I pray for those coming who've, who've come this morning who need a desperate touch from you. Lord, a variety of needs, a variety of reasons why they need a touch from you. But God, I pray that as you know their needs, that you would meet them. Lord, we just pray for uh, those this morning that have come in that are maybe given up hope or maybe who are disillusioned and wondered why as they've watched others receive healing or others be set free and they've not received it yet. God, I pray that they would be reminded that your power doesn't run out. You had enough power to heal the woman of an issue of blood for 12 years and then turn right back around and raise a young girl from the dead. And so, God, we thank you that your power is limitless and that it's not going to run out. And so, Lord, I pray that that would get in the souls and the spirit of people this morning, that they would recognize that no matter what their situation, that you're big enough to handle it. So, God, I pray that all of us across this room would put our trust completely in you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am.
thank you all so, so much for joining us. We hope you have a blessed rest of your day and a blessed week this week. And we will see you next Sunday.